Hello, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to today's conservation conversation. This is a collaboration of nine university centers that seeks to highlight solutions in climate, conservation, and environment. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. The session is being recorded and we will send out a link to everyone who registered within the next few days. All attendees are on mute, but we would love to hear your questions and we will have a little bit of time to get to questions from the audience at the end of the day today. So you can submit your questions throughout on that GoToWebinar controls panel. <clears throat> and now I'd like to introduce uh, Alice, <laughs> Um, Alice Donnelly Madden from the Getchus Wilkinson Center at the University of Colorado Boulder Law School. She will be uh, hosting today. Alice, thank you so much for this third installment of Conservation Conversations. You bet. Thank you all. Um, and thanks, Dominique. It's been really rewarding for the center to be part of this series. And I want to give a shout out to all of our university partners. And we are extremely pleased to be hosting today. So I want to say a little bit about Colorado Law. We're one of the top 10 ranked environmental programs, including have one of the very first environmental law clinics in the country. The Asekia Project provides free legal services for protecting water rights to low-income Hispanic farmers in the San Luis Valley. And our dedication to American Indian law dates back to the 1970s. The mission of the Getches Wilkinson Center is driven by an ambitious agenda for deeper influence in law, applied policy and practice, and to be the premier training ground for a pipeline of diverse future leaders. And we do that through creative inter interdisciplinary research, experiential teaching, and innovative problem solving. One of our favorite things to do is convene thought leaders and practitioners, just as we are today, to address the most pressing issues of the times, like climate change, water resources, electricity systems, environmental justice, and of course, public lands. So let me introduce you today's speakers, each of whom has worked with the tribal coalition that proposed the Bears Ears National Monument to President Obama. I could take half this program just telling you about these amazing people, so I urge you to read more about them on the Conservation Conversations webpage. So Charles Wilkinson's gonna be kicking us off today. So Charles, Jim, and Daniel can turn on your cameras, please. Uh, Charles is the beloved Moses Lasky Professor of Law Emeritus and Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado. He's written 14 books with another on the way and has far too many awards to possibly mention today. He's taken on many special projects over the years. And most recently, he was a special advisor to the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. Jim Enote is a Zunai tribe member. He's the CEO of the Colorado Plateau Foundation. The breadth of his decades of impactful public service are remarkable. He serves on the boards of Trust for Mutual Understanding and the Grand Canyon Trust. A prolific writer, Jim has received numerous awards and has been a high altitude traditional farmer since childhood. And Daniel Cordalis is a member of the Navajo Nation. He's a natural resources and Indian law attorney who works closely with tribes to protect their water, cultural and natural resources through litigation, resource negotiations, land acquisition, and tribal governance. Previously, Daniel worked with Earth Justice and clerked for the Colorado Supreme Court and the Native American Rights Fund. So I'm gonna hand this off to Charles. I'll pop back in later to facilitate our Q&A. So be sure to send your questions in via the chat line. Thanks so much and enjoy this conversation. Thanks, Alice, and uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to be here today. At a long and emotional meeting of Indian people in July 2015, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, the Northern Ute Tribe, the Navajo Nation, the Zuni Pueblo, and the Hopi Pueblo voted to establish the Bears Ears Intertribal uh, Coalition to petition President Obama to create the Bears Ears uh, National Monument on federal public lands in Southern Utah. Indian people had gone there since time immemorial to live, pray, celebrate, gather food, and raise their families. The area has deep spiritual meaning to these tribes. It is glory country. Iconic Western writer Wallace Stegner wrote that this red rock, long vista country, quote, 
fills up the eye and overflows the soul. The coalition and conservation groups carried out a formidable time-consuming campaign, which the Utah delegation fought bitterly, loudly, and, resentful, and, and relentlessly. Still, in December 2016, President Obama officially created the monument. It was the first time that tribes had ever been successful in establishing a national monument. At 1.3 million acres, it is the second largest national monument in the lower 48 states. It is about 80 miles north to south. It constitutes 2.4% of the entire state of Utah. Yes, I'm using the present tense to describe this monument. The current president attempted to eviscerate this unique and great institution, reducing its size by 85%. The tribes have sued, and the clear consensus of public land scholars and attorneys is that the tribes have the better case and that the Obama creation is still the law. Oh, reality. Which is more real? President Obama's historic and uplifting document or the current president's mean-spirited and short-sighted attempt. Today, we will take up collaborative management and traditional knowledge, two distinguished features of bear's ears and notions that can be applied in public lands uh, across the country. The tribes, especially traditional voices, put in a great deal of effort into convincing the Obama administration to include them in the presidential proclamation, and they succeeded in having um, uh, collaborative management and traditional knowledge embedded in this, in the managing document, the proclamation. This is the first time that this kind of management has been prescribed for federal public lands. Make no mistake about it. Modern tribes are truly sovereign governments and they've placed, placed high uh, priority on natural resources and cultural resources. As Daniel Cordalis and Jim Enote will discuss, they and their, the, the tribes and their staff scientists have been active in working with federal agencies, state and local governments and corporations to improve conditions on the country's lands and waters, often by cooperative agreements. Tribes have had a lot to say about public lands, but always from the outside. Jim and Daniel will offer their views on how collaborative management between tribal sovereigns and federal agency is realistic and can bring luster to bear's ears and other public holdings. I think you will be most interested in traditional knowledge. This is the body of values, experiences, and practices that tribes have used since deep antiquity. The tribes don't claim that their traditional knowledge is better than Western, Western knowledge about the natural world. Western science is often very useful to the tribes. It's just that traditional knowledge is different. It is another way of knowing. We are so fortunate to hear from Daniel Cordalis, Navajo, who is deeply knowledgeable and creative about traditional knowledge, and Jim Eno Zuni, who is one of the leading figures in the world in the field of indigenous traditional knowledge that is receiving considerable and increasing attention globally and as well as nationally. Jim, uh, my first question for you um, is just to, to, to get us started and uh, uh, on, on traditional knowledge and maybe use some examples at, at Zuni if, that, if you think that's appropriate. Well, thank you, Charles. Uh, First, let's, let's acknowledge that we live in a world with many ways of knowing, 
and it is a world with multiple knowledges, ontologies, and experiences. And science is one sphere of knowledge and uh, discipline, and there are others. I believe that traditional knowledge is an awareness and consciousness that's acquired when a person or a group is planted in the same social and environmental conditions for a very long time. And native peoples, in that case, uh, can easily be at least a thousand years. Traditional knowledge also materializes when the language is spoken and developed around and in response to those environmental and social conditions. And I think then language is a code and it is an expression of ideas and order and meanings. Uh, language then serves as a vessel for that traditional knowledge while ceremony helps to preserve the patterns, the associations and trust and belief in traditional knowledge. In the Bears Ears area that you mentioned, Charles, there are petroglyphs, petroglyph panels that I believe are maps. And they provide evidence of water sources in a dry environment. The locations of some of the most suitable agricultural lands and soils, and I think wisdom gathered by healers and uses of medicinal plants. Here in Zuni, where I live in western New Mexico, what is now New Mexico, uh, in my former service as a museum director, I have seen one and two and three thousand year old ceramics that are illustrated with ibises, egrets, and other wetland birds. And we rarely see those birds here today. That is traditional knowledge as witness to climate change and displayed in three dimensions. Um, uh, uh, Daniel, um, let me ask you to uh, get, get us started on uh, collaborative management. Sure, uh, thanks Charles. And Jim, thanks for that description of traditional knowledge as, as always extremely deep and um, resonate in somewhere that it's hard to explain um, how profound that can be. I, uh, collaborative management, my understanding and the way I like to think about collaborative management is it's really a practice to basically harmonize our relationship and our management in a sustainable way on our public lands and our, and our public resources, our natural resources. Um, and, and the point of it here, especially with, between tribes and federal government, is to create plans and to create a sustainable way of including humans as a part of the ecosystem as, as, as a relevant species. I think our, a lot of our land management plans today um, really just control who has access when and how much to public lands and the resources. Um, I think this is just flat wrong. This is a wrong. This is not the right approach to how we should be managing our public lands and natural resources. We need to be viewing ourselves as active participants of that ecosystem, who whose ability to survive is codependent with the health of that ecosystem itself. Um, and I think, and I believe that tribal, co tribal federal collaborative management of these resources can, can get us there. I think that the views of, the, of, of not just one, one side or just, I think the views of all interested communities, and especially tribal who have, who, who have this type of knowledge about the land, um, really create an environment for real lasting and meaningful land management. Um, and, and that's where I think collaborative management really has has legs and that's why I, that's why i think i really believe in it as, as the future of land management one uh basic uh, way of thinking about public lands i, I believe is that uh, so many outside interests non-federal interests um uh have things they want to get out of public lands and they, they can be many different kinds of things 
And as a general matter, we're very cautious about having outside influence um, uh, express and, and having um, companies and counties have uh, controlling voices or strong voices uh, in management. Here, collaborative management would mean that the, the tribes and the uh, uh, agencies would both have, what, co-equal voices? And is that dangerous? Is that, is that an appropriate way to do the public lands that are there for all the people? I, I of course, I, I don't believe that's inappropriate at all. Um, Tribes are, we, have, we retain, tribal governments retain status under the constitution. Um, there's a long history um, built that supports tribes as sovereign governments. And tribes now, um, as much as ever, are extremely capable. We have extremely deep information, whether e even utilizing Western science to support um, the tribal perspectives and the tribal views on, on management. I think that tribes have also felt that out of the whole man land management process, we've probably been, our viewpoints have been less heard than many others. Um, of course, we are a part of the public, right? And so when we talk about public land management, in the inclusion of tribes is e extremely appropriate, especially alongside other, like you said, states and counties who, whose voices are very present in those land management. Um, uh, either practices or the development of those plans. Um, the inclusion of tribes just is, it, it's fair, it makes sense, and it makes stronger plans. Um, Jim, thank you for, for that uh, uh, statement you had earlier about traditional knowledge. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, how do you assess um, the practicality of collaborative management and uh, traditional knowledge now uh, as guiding principles for a national monument, Bears Ears, but other tribes became very interested in collaborative management during the, the, the Bears Ears episode. And um, uh, is it workable? Is it um, can 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 the real depth of uh, traditional knowledge be recognized? I think you uh, your audio is off, Jim. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, let, let me preface this then with. Uh, maybe talking a bit about the difference between traditional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge. And I think that the term traditional ecological knowledge is based in biological, social sciences, uh, ethnography, and anthropology. And there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, it, it follows a specific order and process. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I want to see strong science in public lands management just as I want to see more professional native scientists. Native traditional knowledge, or call it indigenous traditional knowledge, is another sphere of knowledge in a world of many knowledges. And if care is not taken, traditional ecological knowledge can eclipse or subjugate traditional knowledge to an ethnoscience. And we end up with ethnoastronomy, ethnobotany, and others. And that, that's fine in some situations. But it does not allow traditional knowledge to stand alone and be fully appreciated in this pure form. So in, in some way, the, the world is bound by secret knots. And I believe our challenge is not how we bring knowledge systems together, but instead how we learn across knowledge systems. So. I think maybe if we think about another way of knowing, uh, I'm sure uh, most of us have asked ourselves, as human beings, do we really know all there is to know? And you know, I, I was trained as a university uh, in, in sciences, and 
I know science is based in creating hypotheses and testing hypotheses and measuring matter. I don't remember my great grandparents measuring matter, really. And in our in our ceremonial uh, places, our leaders would talk about maintaining the cosmological process in certain ways, but nobody ever raised their hands and said, "Prove it." And, and I think maybe if you think about another way of knowing this way, that uh, an experienced bow hunter understands what it takes to stalk an elk to be within 15 yards of an ethical killing shot and a fisher intuitively can read the water and i have known some helicopter pilots that can sense barometric pressure better than an altimeter or as well as they understand as well other ways of knowing now about collaborative management then i i think that you know if we are truly an egalitarian society and we are moving forward with centripetal answers to some complex problems, then we should employ the widest scope of imagination and knowledge is, and we should solve the most complex problems with that kind of inclusiveness. It just makes sense, as Daniel was saying earlier. But also I think, but when we think about it, look, in, in let's remember that men from many tribal nations served as code talkers during World War I and World War II. That was clearly a strategic use of native traditional knowledge. And I think if we all I think we all know that some of the world's medicines have been derived from the knowledge gained by native peoples. And that has led to much of the world's uh, profession of medicine and pharmacy and other things. Uh, I think it just makes sense. It's it's I think it's time to take traditional knowledge, native traditional knowledge, off the bench. Um, could you take um, um, an example of traditional knowledge, uh, a plant perhaps? Um, um, I, I will say to all of you in the audience that Jim is somebody who is uh, deeply a farmer. And I think that his, uh, the great joy of his life is to get out uh, in his uh, farm uh, every year. And so maybe a, some, a, a plant species, how could, what would you recommend um, in terms of, of Zuni traditional knowledge with a particular plant in, in terms of moving it into federal land management and, um, and, 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 the, the procedures of how to protect it and 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 uh, and so forth. Jim, you're off again. Please start at the beginning. We don't want to lose any of it. <laughs> no, I said that. No, thank you, Charles. And I want to be sure we leave time for for Daniel uh, to comment on this too. But yeah, I have been planting 63 consecutive years. Since I was in the cradle board, I planted planted seeds as a, uh, with my grandparents. And you know, the, in the 80s, we were already talking about intellectual property and protection of intellectual property. So I think we, we know that we're strong in that area. We know what to share and not what not to share. Uh, but there are certain things that I think will contribute to our gathering of different knowledges and well like say yucca you're talking about yucca plants um, i mean it, it is fiber it is cordage uh it can be eaten it can be made into soap it's used for many things uh some of it you know it's it's uh it's private you know it, it's like belongs to the tribe and our own people and uh, but other things i think i could say as a metaphor i'll give an example uh that when I was in my field as a, as a boy, my, my grandfather was telling me to go get some onions for dinner and pull them up and I was gathering onions. He said, more, get more. And I had a, just a, a armload of onions and I kept dropping them. They were dropping them, I walk and they drop. And my grandfather said, wait a moment. And he, he walked and he got his pocket knife out, which he always had. And uh, he went to the yucca plant that was in our field. We always had yucca plants. We never weeded them and took them out. But he cut some blades off of there stripped them, tied them together, 
and he wrapped them around that big bundle of onions, tied up, and he said, the first thing you should learn as a human being is how to tie things together. And that's a metaphor, I think, for bringing all the different knowledges when we, we are better together. But also there's, there's like that, that fundamental thing as simple as a yucca plant and its cordage. What does that mean? Do people really think about these sort of things? Uh, that, that's just one example. Now, of course, there are many more. Um, thank you. Uh, Daniel, you uh, talked about collaborative management earlier, and, and uh, let, let's get some uh, hear from you about uh, traditional knowledge also. And um, in terms of collaborative management, um, um, can you think of any species that are, are um, um, common that, that we don't think about most of the times, but have meaning to different tribes in terms of traditional knowledge? And um, suppose some of those plants are, are being threatened. Can you think of an example? Of, of how does that become land management? Sure. To um, I think this gets to the point of really how does this work, right? I mean, this I think it's really important to understand. But I think as as a concept, I think it's uh, it's not terribly difficult to agree that having these in inclusive um, approaches to management makes a lot of sense. Um, but how does it work, right? I think that that's that's what becomes tricky. In the bear's ears, I mean, thinking about um, our own experience as, as or my experience as as a, a Navajo Diné person, and we share some of the um, um, some of the same uses and uh, practices as Jim and and Zuni and does at Zuni with with yucca, for example, right? We use that for a lot of different uses in ceremony and just in in, in daily practice. Um, and you think of uh, other root, right? I know we've there's bear root or OSHA. That's that's not that's, it's not as prolific, um, and it presents itself in landscapes and it's subject to different kind of grazing and it's it, it just needs more attention and care. Um, so we, you could imagine this when you look at a, a management, you look at a landscape not as a, a set of d d discrete kind of management parts, but more of as a, a, as a living system, you can see kind of wh where things grow in, in terms of seasons, when, when you approach to different parts of the land uh, and how you use it, right? Um, if, you, if you know these things and a, a, a tribe's able to, and let's say in, in an example of bear's ears, where you have this, this, this shared traditional knowledge uh, amongst tribes and we'll say, okay, how, how are we going to offer this to, to an agency? How are we going to offer this to the BLM here or the Forest Service? Um, and presenting that and saying here, the, the examples of how traditional knowledge is, is looks on the landscape through, let's just say, yucca and through bear root, you're really able to kind of explain kind of where, where and when different parts of the land are um, maybe need different management practices, right? I mean, if you're looking at a, a recreation management plan, I mean, you, you can definitely define areas better when you have that kinds of traditional knowledge being used. And the way it would work, of course, at Bears Ears is, is, I mean, collaborative management Bears Ears hopefully means that tribes are involved in the kind of most processes that lead to management, on the ground management, whether that's coordinating with local offices, helping to find staff to put in those local offices. Um, I think that makes, I mean, so much of what this collaborative management looks beyond just bears here is, is, is the staff, right? The, the federal staff who are tasked with working with tribes to kind of effectuate the, the, the practice. And you really, and having a tribal voice input as well, um, supporting, supporting tribal input and um, even, even tribal members as, in those in those as personnel goes goes a long ways to to achieving these results um so when we, if, when when a tribe is working and talking with those local offices bringing it up in in make planning meetings 
there's there's a good understanding and an acceptance of what what this means and, uh, and to really you, integrate it into the land use management you can uh, that's the whole thing yeah when, when when you're working on that land use plan you're able to see more clearly how it fits within an actual western on on the ground plan you know you mentioned osha and um and as you've told me uh uh and and, and is true uh there's more commercial harvesting now of osha by 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 uh non indian uh entities and um um are you saying that um it might be that you would have a closure of an area uh for osha that would be politically difficult um but would that be something that would be included in collaborative management if if, if the uh, findings were such i think there, yes absolutely I mean, just any almost like any other resource that is is sensitive uh, is, is subject to long kind of or, or difficult recovery paths i mean it, ab, closing closing harvest um has to be on the table has to be an absolute option in any time I mean, for, you know, for, for the protection of the species and just for the ecosystem and which supports the relationship and the health of the land and the people on that land. Thank you. And I, and I, I want to uh, stick with you for a minute and, and have Jim follow up on this. Um, you're in the Northwest now, uh, uh, a bit west of the Navajo Nation, having married well. <laughs> and uh, and so you've seen a lot of what's going on out there. And so in the Northwest and, and nationally, there have been, and this, again, I want Jim to follow up on this. There are already areas where there is co-management or collaborative management. And we and and tribes have have perhaps been very uh, helpful and instrumental in in those efforts. And uh, so, just just in terms of um, again real practical land management, um, we, we've never done it. Tribes are consulted, and there have been MOAs and so on. But they, there certainly hasn't been collaborative or co-management, co if you want to call it that. But 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 there have been in other areas, and tell us a bit about what's happened in the Northwest. Right, um, right now I am I'm in my office in Arcata, California, which is former Weyot territory, and oh, it is still Weyot ancestral land, and which is just south of um, Yurok ancestral territory, which uh, my wife and my kids are tribal members of. And really, what's happened out here in the Northwest, and us included, um, is a lot of collaboration over the fishery resource. As you know, tribes have always worked and worked the different waters, the oceans and, and the rivers of the Northwest to harvest fish um, in a very kind of sustainable sort of way. Um, of course, in the last hundred years, the fish runs have gotten really decimated through large scale development, um, rivers which no longer function as rivers hardly and um, oceans which have been um, re really changed considerably too. Um, tribal scientists and Yurok included are extremely... Well, how many scientists do, 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 do the Yuroks have working on salmon? I think our fisheries department um, and of course they it, it, it's beyond salmon right I mean there's, there's a lot of trust species yeah. in the river um, some that are have gone extinct, and some that are just barely hanging on. I think there's probably 40 to 50 folks in the fisheries department that are looking at river issues. 40 to 50 are those? How many of those are scientists? I would. I, I, I'm not totally sure. I'm probably 25, mm -hmm. which is a substantial part of the the tribal um, uh, government staff. I think that it's more weighted in fisheries than any other area of the tribe, I would say. And, and the, most of the tribes in the Northwest have substantial yeah. fisheries management staffs. Yeah, and pro probably probably best um, probably bested only by the state government. Mm -hmm. And so the the collaboration between tribes and 
all the other entities on fisheries management is absolutely critical, right? I mean, I think what what the, what the tribal scientists do day in and day out on the river really presents a lot of the um, fundamental work of our understanding of these rivers. And so, collaboratively, yes, they, we 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 work on harvests. What what is a reasonable harvest? Um, the, the tribe by itself determines on that re reasonable harvest what I should say what an out what, what what a harvest could be is the tribe itself looks at what they should be harvesting. There have been years when the Yurok tribe has received a, an allocation in in bad water years um, or bad fish run years. Well, the tribe just says we we can't we can't rightfully undertake a a, a, um, a fishery this year because it's it's not right for the species. And while we could do it, and while there are commercial fishermen out doing it, we're just not going to do it. It's, it's 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 the wrong time to do it for the species. Um, so there's there's been a lot of really, I think, useful collaboration between tribes, the state, federal government, and even 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 commercial private entities to kind of manage these fisheries. Jim, how do you see the issue of uh, 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 nationally of uh, uh, tribes um, having substantial capabilities and being involved in um, uh, cope management, collaborative management in different contexts? Well, I, I can think of maybe going back a few years. I, I can remember also in my other service, I was the director of natural resources for the Zuni tribe. and during, uh, let's see, there was the Zuni River Watershed Act of 1991 that was intended to bring together the Zuni, uh, Rayman Navajo Band, the Big Navajo, the Forest Service, uh, and um, then the Soil Conservation Service to create a watershed plan. And that, that seemed in 1991 to be pretty forward thinking. And, but, uh, uh, Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. And I, I can remember being in meetings with the other partners and raising the idea of traditional knowledge in those meetings and the lead for the Soil Conservation Service would look at me and say, literally in front of all the others would say, whatever. And not only was that rude, but that just said like how stayed and fit in the box orthodoxy was existing at time at the time in federal agencies. The good news is those people are retired. Other people are moving in. Uh, there is hope. And I think that it, it's been difficult for one to, to bring, think, uh, bring about the idea of collaborative management and co-management. Uh, one, because it just has not been a priority for many agencies and it is easier to do things as they've been done before. But where I think we need to be as tribal nations is that I think really the tribes need to have the capacity to participate as equals at the table. Basically, the, the, the table is set differently than it is at home. Um, and so I think that's the next thing. And you know, the Bears Ears National Monument was going to be that opportunity. Uh, my my great hope for the Bears Ears National Monument was was to have actually a learning institute, a traditional knowledge institute that would be there to help uh, bring together the agencies and the tribal nations, and it would inform the management of Bears Ears National Monument. So you know maybe we need something like that in other places, uh, but that's 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 where we get into the reg statutes and and secretary orders and the rest. Um, let me ask you both to uh, speak to this question, uh, which is we're in a presidential election and um, if a new administration comes in, they're going to want to do certain things. And, and if the uh, current administration stays in, it will be looking to the future. Um, what recommendations do you have to the next administration on collaborative management and traditional knowledge? 
Jim, I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a quick shot here first. Um, we got to change the way it's going right now. I just think it's just, it's just that simple. While we have had some advances in other er in some areas, we are, we've got a long way to go to making sure the tribal voice is considered, listened to, and um, <laughs> big picture, right? The federal government has a trust responsibility to work with tribes in land management decisions. Um, as a just an extremely quick example, we out here at, at Yurok and on the Klamath River just last week got a decision from um, really the Secretary of the Interior saying that the tribe that the, that the department will no longer or will not this year provide flows, water flows, to support the tribe's ceremony, which is this weekend. The tribe's been working for months, years to try to get this water and and ignored requests throughout the summer and only and last week. This was your annual world renewable every other year. Ceremony. Every other year. Yep. World renewal okay. ceremony. And part of it takes the second con completing part of it requires um, um, you know, ceremonialists in a large redwood hand carved canoe to float down the river. Standing, singing, praying. And because we have four dams on the Klamath that are in a really tight management regime, water doesn't flow naturally on the Klamath River. And so we need it, we need some, we need the, the agency really to release water from its 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 projects to support those flows. And they just decided they weren't gonna do it. Um, the rationale was thin, basically saying, well, we don't have a trust responsibility that forces us to do it. And despite this huge body of, of federal law and policy that su exact supports this exact kind of decision in, for, the, for the agencies, they're just not doing it. And so collaborative management, ha we, need, we need to be able to listen to tribes and not, take, not make decisions from the very top based on political, um, political statements that don't reflect anything that's happening on the ground. So what the next administration needs to do is empower their regional offices, empower their, their local offices to work with tribes. Tell them they have a responsibility, a trust responsibility. Tell them to read their policy directives and enact them because that's just not what's happening right now. And I think that we don't need to rewrite and, and create a whole new monument to, coll to collaborative management. There, there, there's one there. We're just we as in the federal government is and or i said they are just not following it we, we can do this without without creating national monuments across the west we can do this with just picking up the phone and and making a call good jim yeah i think that if you're you're talking about new administrations certainly they're you know, in, in truth, like in, in Southern Utah and other places, people in the federal agencies certainly have their minds made up about things, about how to do things. Uh, but I think uh, that Daniel's is definitely correct, definitely right, about working with the local agencies. And I think the time is now, today, to start being shovel ready with the language for the rationale and purpose for making collaborative management, co-management happen. And looking at yeah, all the different titles in the codes of federal regulations, whether it's title 43 or 50 or seven or 25, look at those and talk with the agencies and say, listen, it's in there, as Daniel said, but we have to be shovel ready with that. We have to be ready now, uh, come January, we need to have that there. We need to have our binder ready and say, we're ready to go. Let's make this happen. And you know, sentiments aside, you know, uh, agencies, the public and others may say, well, you know, the, those poor native people, forget that, you know, sentiments don't last that long. They don't get us very far. I think we know, many of us know that it just does make sense. It really does. And I think integrating traditional knowledge could cultivate some new kinds of relationships uh, in interagency work and amongst tribes, but also to help create a more informed citizenry. 
Charles, one more point just before we turn to probably to like lady questions or you wrap up. Um, I mean, tribes are trying to lock up the public lands and resources for our exclusive use, right? I think we understand that there's limitations there. I mean, these, we, I mean, what tribes are trying to do is add a layer of information and knowledge to how the how these lands are being managed in a way that better supports the resource, we believe, um, and re and really imbues like a, a a different kind of worldview onto land where we are a part of it and we we need to cut we need to be within this ecosystem to, to support it the next hundred years through all these changes we're going to have I mean, I, we just think i mean we cannot be moving forward as land management is going on right now and expect the resource to to remain healthy or to Well, thank you both. I think uh, Alice has some questions now, and uh, uh, we'd be anxious to hear those. Sure, there's been some great questions coming in, um, and I'll have to stare really closely at the screen to read them. So, um, uh, one I think is particularly interesting. Um, do you think that the um, benefits from collaborative land management could be applied to collaborative water resource management and perhaps give a few examples of how that might work. Daniel? Yeah, I can take a quick shot at this. I mean, this is kind of exactly what we're talking about here. Um, you know, we're trying to work with on, on the Klamath, right? We actually have a cooperative agreement with the Interior Department from 2006 um, where we're supposed to be discussing water related um allocations uses whatever it is right um it's it's not amounted to the paper that it's been printed on so far but yeah i mean we have it it absolutely can be and should be used for water too i mean there I and mean, water is so important right we we get that we get that that's not that's not a difficult thing um yet we're still using the laws that we've generated 150 years ago to define how we use water and what constitutes a beneficial use? We have we have no, no sense in or ability to um, to value water right now the way we need to value water right now. And through a collaborative manage approach, I think we can absolutely do that because it'll bring the people who, who need and care about the water the most to the table. Jim, no, I think Daniel answered that very well. Yes. All right, here's another one. Um, how can communities adjacent to Native communities integrate and elevate Native knowledge in their own ecological practices? How can a largely white community appropriate, appropriately reach out to our neighbors to integrate Native knowledge keepers in our leadership? Jim? Well, I think we, we've been getting that, uh, that suggestion for a long time. And I think just ha having simple things like uh, forums uh, where people have the opportunity to participate in, in talking about different knowledges, plural, and respecting those. And I think that, you know, again, you know, I think if, if there would have been Bears Ears National Monument already you know, now three, four years down the road, we already would have been well on our way to having an institute of traditional knowledge yeah. and i think uh, many communities that are alongside uh, public lands can be thinking about some sort of a a, a center an institute a, a place where knowledges can be shared and, and talked about uh, that that would be one place to start okay and and uh, uh the question and uh, uh jim's answer um shows that there's real potential in um uh having traditional knowledge presented in 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 uh very graphic ways whether it's demonstrations or uh hallway exhibits or uh annual conferences international conferences uh at bears ears and uh and so uh, uh, good traditional knowledge, bringing it to life at Bears Ears or any other federal uh, in, uh, uh, entity, uh, land management entity, will, will, will really um, 
uh, spice up the 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 uh, land and see it in a different way and uh, for visitors. And so, uh, it, 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 if it's done right and 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 the tribes work well with the federal government officials and the uh, and and I think that's realistic. You could have some really really good. Uh, uh, information on collaborative management and different kinds of information and uh, draw people in and, and make their visits uh, even more satisfying. Charles? Oh, if you don't mind, I, just had a, I got a quick yeah. thing to, to respond to that question. Um, looking at the challenges we've had uh, either out here in the Northwest or when we were working at Bears Ears um, on, on how tribes engage in collaborative management, it's not easy for tribes to do so, frankly, right? We have, our staff are totally booked. They have incredible amounts of work they need to do right now, right? And sometimes they just don't have project codes to bill it to either. They just don't have funding to do a lot of this work. Um, so thinking about how to, how to help and to make this really happen, I mean, we see money out there, right? That there, there's money out there in, in the fill fill up the brand, the conservation community. Sorry, I'm my tongue's too big right now. Um, but I mean, ways to support tribal involvement on this, either with through agencies or through local communities, um, would mean a lot. And it doesn't have to be an extreme amount of money. It just needs to be something to kind of make make the, get the tribe's attention and their ability to free up a few hours every month. So I, I, I just think that cannot be understated, the, the importance of, of yeah. practically being able to find a funding me mechanism to get tribes involved. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Daniel. You know, my colleagues in the field, I, I, I run the Colorado Plateau Foundation, and, and there are many, many good people, good, noble people doing good work in philanthropy uh, around this area. And I think that this, this place where, you know, uh, non-native communities and native communities and agencies come together uh, need some support of course the the traditional knowledge moving that forward needs support and all always but i think that the idea of really building some kind of collaboration in a way that is usually about co-laboring and co-elaborating around something mutually agreed on uh, this is an area that i think would really help to build what collaboration means around protecting and uh, preserving our public lands. So I, mm. I, I call on our, our, our colleagues in the, in the philanthropic field, uh, donors and others to step up and help support this work. Mm. Okay, we have another one um, concerning outdoor recreation, which has been exponentially increasing throughout the years, even now during a pandemic, or maybe especially now during the pandemic. How could tribal collaboration, TK or TEK, help manage outdoor recreation? A jump ball here, I guess. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, think, yeah, I think about the pandemic. I mean, it's there's there's it's so diverse in the response to it. Uh, I mean, we are still locked down here. We still have daily curfews. We still have curfew from Friday. Uh, sunset to Monday morning. Uh, masks are required. They were totally shut down. The good news is uh, we have zero, we've had zero cases, new cases over the past two weeks. Um, so I look forward to getting out there too. But when we do, uh, I think that uh, getting out there in the land and, and being active, you know, using this this gift of our body and our eyes and our ears and our senses to appreciate what's out there it, it's not that far away from what traditional knowledge is as i was describing it earlier and i think you know again i keep going back to this this idea of having a center or an institute for traditional knowledge where different knowledges and ideas can come together and inform the management of of uh, public lands I think that's where people in recreation and others can come together and have some discussion. Uh, it's it's going to be um, uh, it's going to some there might be some resistance. I can understand that, but you know things that are imaginative and unfamiliar will always be that way. Mm. Yep. 
tell us, I think we, there's different examples ongoing right now, right? Especially with climbing. I think climbing is really, really one of the trickiest ones. Um, you've seen that at, at Bear Butte, um, also known as Devil's Tower, um, and some other climbing spots in California and in uh, Nevada. Um, as, as Jim was saying, when people use 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 their different senses to kind of address to how what's going to how their interaction with the land is. I mean, the way this works for maybe a non-native person is you, you also use your heart, right? And you use your respect for what the tribe, what you understand that is important to the tribes. If I understand that, that climbing on a church is disrespectful, I, I, I won't do it because I respect that. I think, that's, it's, I think that, that respect needs to go both ways. Okay. Um, so uh, we know that the collaborative management um, system that had been set up for Bears Ears has been ignored or almost dismantled. Um, um, imagining a different world in the future in a few months, perhaps, um, what other uh, places would you want to advise the federal government to tr start immediately trying to create collaborative management? A couple of examples. Oh, I'll go so on. I, I just out here in the clan with it has to happen. You have to. I mean, it's it's the water resource, but there's also there, there there are shared locations of cultural importance, very similar, like, like small areas like Bears Ears that the, all the different tribes use and consider the same thing, um, consider the same way. And the, the Ling the Ling case, the Supreme Court, the bad case for the tribes and. Late 70s is just shows that these conflicts have been around for a long time. So I think there's there's some out here, but I know Jim Jim probably has quite a good list. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Obviously, at the top of the list for me is uh, the Bears Ears National Monument. That's one. Another is the Grand Canyon National Park, which is you know, an emergence place and center of the world for many tribes in this region. Uh, and you know, there's a huge dam. Uh, the Glen Canyon Dam there that is, is managed for a variety of purposes, but there's also just many cultural places within the Grand Canyon. Another is the Grand Staircase Escalante, uh, which definitely could use some collaborative management, and there are many others in this region. I think we have um, time for one more question. Um, so beyond the status of sovereign governments, um, how would you engage um, tribal interests earlier in the uh, process of, of current public lands management? <laughs> well, I, I think, well, um, you know, I, I remember being uh, invited to some meetings years ago in, in the Grand Canyon and a few other uh, places. And we were at the table as advisors that we were part of an advisory committee and we could make some comments and 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 such but we were just advisors we were, we were part of an advisory committee and i'm not discounting that and downplaying that i'm not disparaging those people that invited us but it isn't the same thing as being a decision maker and i think uh, if you're going to bring people to the table from tribal mm -hmm. nations that they need to be assured that they are there and their time is respected and their knowledge is respected and is part of actually making some decisions going forward and, and Alice, just to add on to that i mean i think you you look at the current land management um, planning process as as whatever it is um but a, a collaborative a collaborative relationship means you're you're talking repeatedly constantly not just at the start of an of a of a planning process it's you have these relationships to build on and to basically start that scoping process from day one with those with the those that information behind you and with yeah. some and with some knowledge to build off of i just want to thank the three of you this has been fascinating i know we're going to end in just a moment wanted to make sure you all saw the announcement for the next uh series um, so thanks again to the organizers. Thank you to our speakers. This has been fascinating. We actually have, we can capture these questions and um, you have our contact information from the previous slide. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you.